This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural text today comes from the fourth chapter of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 27. In the New Living Translation of the Scripture, you'll notice there these words. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. Now, this is a father now talking to his son. This is very parental when sometimes parents talk to their children and they wonder, is that child even listening to me? And you'll be surprised at the least suspecting time, they'll, they'll say something and you'll realize, you know what? They did hear me. But he says, let it penetrate deep into their hearts. Verse 22, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. And I'm speaking today simply from the subject, protect your treasure. Protect your treasure. My growing up in the business world, I'd hear my dad say, it takes so much more to protect a business than it does to build one. It takes more to protect a marriage than it does to get married. It takes more to protect your children than it does to simply have your children. So whatever it is that you build, you're going to have to put a greater effort into protecting it. Because it's not until you have built something of worth and value that the enemy wants to come in. He always goes where the worth, wealth is. He goes where the worth is. Listen, I mean, health is wealth because what good is money to you if you're sick? If you don't feel good, you don't want to go anywhere. I mean, if you lose your health, you lose your wealth. And so he's going after your health, your, your wealth, your health is a treasure. And so when you discover that there are so many things that are amazing treasures, the, the word of the Lord is saying, listen, protect what comes out of your heart because that's your treasure chest. Uh, in the Hebrew world, the heart spoke of the very center of who you are. It was the central control system of our lives. So whatever you wanted to be able to get in a person's life, if you have the key to their heart, you've got the key to everything that's in the hand. If you'll get the right key, it'll open up every other door that you need to, to open. So the master key to the whole body and the whole life and everything that comes out of the life is the key to the heart. There's the key to the heart. And when we talk about the heart, we're not literally talking about the this, this organ that pumps blood through the body. Uh, the, the, your heart is, is, is your will. It's, it's your imagination. Uh, it's, it's your mind. It's, it's the seat of the, of the emotions. It's, it's quite a bit. It's intertwined a lot with, with the soul. Some, sometimes it's, it, it's used interchangeably. But it is the center core of a person. It's the innermost being where God speaks to our heart. It is the spiritual person that lives on the inside that guides everything else that comes out of it. And so when I'm saying protect your, 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 your treasure, I don't mean this in some type of a fearful way of where you're just on lockdown and you don't want to do anything out of fear. No, no, no. When I'm saying this, I'm saying protecting your heart it doesn't arise out of fear, but out of an awareness of what is truly valuable in your life. So this is not about fear. This is about the awareness of the value that you carry in your life. It's so interesting that the Bible has a different value in our culture than, let's say, a Ben Franklin. Because I can leave my Bible on the front seat of my car, and I have on many occasions, 
Nobody has ever <laughs> broken in to steal my Bible. I don't care whether it's leather bound and, you know, I've got one with ostrich skin on it. I'm, you know, I left it in the car and nobody ever took it. But if I left a Ben Franklin, I mean, I can leave my Bible on the front seat of the car with the windows down and nobody is going after it. They don't recognize that this is a treasure chest. They don't really recognize that this is a, is a real value book here that's loaded with, with treasure that can bless your life in an incredible way. So you have to protect what you deem as valuable. A friend of mine, you know, he, his, his daughter was out in the, in the yard one day and, and, and a, a little boyfriend came pulling up in a sports car in the convertible and, and, he, and he told her to come over to the car and, and, and whispered something to her. And so she had to come and get permission from her daddy to be able to hop into this young man's car. And the father told her, he says, no, 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 you're not going with them because I don't know him. He's got a sporty car. No, you can't go. And she folded her little arms as teenagers often do and stuck her lip out and, and, and lowered her head and walked into the house. And she had an attitude the rest of the day. The father went to her and knocked on her door and he said, honey, I, I, I want to explain to you why I didn't let you go. He said, I didn't know that young man. And he said, I wouldn't have let him take a briefcase with a million dollars in it and drive off if I didn't know him. And he looked at her and he said, sweetheart, you're worth more than a million dollars to me. So why would I let you go off with some dude who just pulls up in a fancy car who had some ill motives in his heart about what he wanted to do with you because he saw that you were attractive and wanted to take you off. He says, you're too valuable for me to let you just go off with somebody that I don't know. You protect your valuables. Protect your valuables. That's what we are called to do in our life is to protect the things that we deem to be valuable in our life. So I want you to think about it. What is your treasure? Is your treasure your time? You know, you're not going to get any more of it. Time is a treasure. Uh, is it your, your financial portfolio? Is it your real estate holdings? I mean, what's your real treasure? Is it your spouse? Is it your family? Are they your relationships? Is it your, your degree? Is it your job title? Is it, is it your destiny? Is it your purpose? What's valuable to you? What are your values? And whatever your valuables are, they are something that need to be protected. But you'd better make sure that you are not losing diamonds collecting stones. Uh, I, I love something that James Clear says. He says, don't sacrifice peace of mind for a piece of luxury. Because sometimes you're just trying to have luxury and you're sacrificing the peace of your mind trying to pay for luxury and you've lost the peace of your mind. And when you lose your peace, you've lost everything because nothing, to tell the truth, is worth your peace. If you lose your peace, you've lost one of the most valuable things because you can't enjoy whatever you have. If you don't have peace, you can't enjoy a fine meal of some of the most eloquent cuisine prepared by the greatest culinary artist. If you don't have any peace that's there, if whatever you have, if you don't have your peace, if you lose your peace of mind, the peace of luxury doesn't matter. But how do you protect your peace? How do you protect your peace? Proverbs chapter 4 verse 24 through 27 gives us three helpful clues for protecting our peace. Number one, our mouths. Use your mouth to protect your peace. If you hold your peace, you'll keep your peace. Uh, verse 24 says, avoid all perverse talk. Avoid all perverse talk. All perverse talk. If you don't know what perverse means, look it up. And if you're still in doubt about it, go on social media and look under some of the crazy posts and you'll find some of the most vile, vitriol, uh, negative, uh, antagonistic, contumacious, iconoclastic spewing of, <laughs> of, of just, can you tell that I feel sort of strongly about some of the negative <laughs> stuff that you find online? 
about people that if you say something positive, there have been times that I have posted a scripture and not put the scriptural reference, and people in the comments are disagreeing, and I'm like, ignoramus, you're not disagreeing with me. This is God's Word. I mean, if you can't say something nice, just be quiet. You don't have to feel compelled to make a comment about everything. If you want to keep your peace, hold your peace. Some things are not worth fighting over. So avoid all perverse talk and stay away from corrupt speech. Corrupt speech. And it's corrupt speech and perverse talk even if it's not directly in a conversation with you verbally, they can be sliding in your DMs. Are you listening? And you know where that perverse stuff goes, when it goes sideways, when somebody is texting you and sliding into your DMs. I mean, they just slide up to you now. They don't, they don't have to get your telephone number. They just need your Instagram handle, your TikTok handle. They just, they just, they want to slide in and it's going to be perverse and it's going to be corrupt. You know what corrupt stuff is and perverse stuff. It's against the will of God. It's against the Word of God. It's derogatory. It, it is filled with, with profligacy. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's loaded down with profanity, laced with it, negative speech, criticizing something. I mean, how often do you go and read things and then you're actually built up and edified? But more is corrupt and perverse than edifying. And have you ever noticed that when you begin to speak negatively against people, that you begin to feel negatively concerning them in your heart? The moment that you start letting your mouth speak derogatorily about someone, your heart will eventually follow because the mouth is a portal down into the heart. The way that I educate my heart is to speak it with my mouth. The Hebrew word for meditate is the word hogal, H-A-G-A-H. It's the same backwards and forward. It's a palindrome. And so it's the same, but it means to meditate, and it means to speak, to mutter, to utter to oneself. So when you are trying to get the Word of God in you, my son, attend unto my words, incline thine ear unto my saying. For they are life to all of those that find them and health to all their flesh. That was one of the verses here in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 22 that I, I memorized as a teenager and would recite every day, muttering this thing, speaking it over and over. I've read the, Pro the book of Proverbs probably more than any other book with more repetition than any other book in the Bible. It's, it's, a, it's a book of wisdom from a father to a son. If you, need, if you got children, you need all the wisdom and help you can get. So spend some time in, in Proverbs and, and let your mouth begin to speak it, a wellspring of light. Jesus taught, taught us the principle, you shall have whatever you say. Listen, the Bible says, let the weak say that I am strong. I'm strong. You, you, it's not telling a lie. You're calling those things that be not as though they were. That even while I realize that I'm a weak man, that I'm dependent upon God, but in him, in my, in, in, in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. And so I have to see myself through the lens of who God has made me with his help. And I want to be able to use my mouth as a portal to be able to get good things into my heart. If you want good things to get into your heart, speak good things out of your mouth. Jesus taught us the principle, you will have what you say. You will have what you say. You will have what you say. In Mark chapter 11, in verse 23, Jesus taught us that. You'll have what you say. But what do we do? We say what we have. But he said, you'll have what you say. You'll have what you say say. It's very, very interesting. So use your mouth because the mouth is a portal into the heart. And the way that we build that good treasure in our heart is to continually speaking good things out of our mouth, not only to ourselves, speak it to your spouse, speak it to your children. You know, 
Henry Ford said that most fools criticize. He said any, anyone can criticize, he said, and most fools do. It doesn't take much to see the fault and to criticize, but it takes spiritual eyes to be able to see something of worth and value in someone and speak life, speak toward the destiny. And that way it begins to get into your heart. It gets into your heart. You have what you say. Use your mouth. Your mouth is a portal to the contents of your heart. And so when you speak negatively and ill of a particular person, you wonder why you feel so badly toward them because it will shape and create an attitude in you. The second thing are our eyes, our eyes. Notice what it says in verse 25, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Can you imagine the number of lives that have been derailed because they stopped looking straight ahead and start looking over here to see what Mary and Sally and Sue had and on this side what Tom, Dick and Harry had and then start coveting start envying someone else, start becoming jealous of somebody else's blessing because jealousy is simply the process or the result of counting someone else's blessings more than you count your own. And if you will just begin to count your many blessings and begin to name them one by one and see the mercy of God in your own life, you ought to say, Lord, I thank you. I'm just telling you, gratitude, gratitude, gratitude will shift your whole life. It'll shift your perspective. Gratitude will shift your attitude. If you ever get with a person, you can tell positive people, the thing that makes positive people positive is that they are governed by a spirit of gratitude. And it is not that grateful people are the happiest people in the world. It's that the happiest people in the world happen to be grateful people. That's the connection. Your real key to happiness is through your gratitude. Every day, you ought to have some things that you list out to God and say, Lord, I'm thankful for X, Y, Z. Thank you for waking me up this morning, for starting me on my way, for a roof over my head, for food on my table, for clothes on my back. Thank you, God, that I'm in my right mind. Thank you that I have the use and, and activity of my limb. My God, you don't really realize how valuable things are until you lose it, until you get ready to move one day and you can't do it quite as well. You ought to begin to say, Lord, I thank you for, it may not be the best car, but I thank you for transportation from point A to point B. Jesus, it may not be the best, but I thank you. I've had some trouble with these children, but I thank you, God, that I wasn't barren. Thank you that you strengthened my prayer life as a result. Lord, I thank you. You have to be able to give thanks in every situation. It shapes your lifestyle, your mindset. But one of the reasons that he said, look, look straight ahead, get your focus there because where your focus goes, energy flows. You get your focus there. People, more dreams go unfulfilled because of broken focus than any other reason. So he says, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Not all of the stuff that happens is I'm focused on what lies before me. What are my opportunities that lie before me? Look straight ahead, look straight ahead, look straight ahead. You know, we look back with gratitude that, Lord, I made it through that. I could have died. I could have gotten stuck back there. I could have been a victim of what traumatized my life back there. But God, I wouldn't take nothing from a journey because I've come to know you in a special way now that I wouldn't have known had I not gone through what I went through back there. It was my struggles that made me strong. God! But he said, keep focus on what's going up there because you become what you behold. You become what you behold. Your eyes are another powerful portal into your heart. Whatever you keep looking at is the direction in which your life will move. Your life will move in the direction of your gaze. So you'll keep looking at it. And the, the issue with our world today is that we've got people that have so filled themselves with lust-filled images that are available uh, at any moment's notice on a digital device. 
because it creates a dopamine rush in the brain and then that dopamine rush can cause an addiction and now while a person went on to check something on for just a few minutes and just say I'm just gonna peep over here and then, then two hours later and they're gazing still getting deeper and deeper into some of the most gross and vile and vitriol stuff that they can find because the dopamine rush says feed me again give me another hit and then they wonder and then you know they, they assume that because they're doing this all in the privacy of their own home or their car or their office or the bathroom or wherever they do it they assume that they're okay because they're not being caught but I want to caution you here don't confuse not being caught with not being trapped because maybe you didn't get caught but you are trapped and you don't really realize it because it's the dopamine that has trapped you into getting another fix that you got to give me another high so just because nobody knows that you're an addict doesn't mean that you're not trapped in an addictive behavior that is saying feed me again feed me again so don't confuse not being caught with not being trapped because some folks are trapped and they don't know it sin is deceptive sin is deceptive sin is deceptive I want you to take a look at these statements here that laziness kills ambition anger kills wisdom you know you lose your temple and you do stupid things fears kill dreams ego kills growth jealousy kills peace doubt kills confidence now, I want you to notice this you see we live here in the West but uh, when you're in the in the Eastern world in in Hebrew and in Arabic they don't read from left to right they read from right to left now let's read it the other way the right way the Hebraic way ambition kills laziness wisdom kills anger dreams kill fears growth kills ego it's like I don't care about my pride just show me teach me so I can make my own money I don't want to be coming begging you for money anyway I want to grow now and I doubt in myself so that I can grow I bow down growth kills ego peace kills jealousy peace kills jealousy yeah you got a nice house yeah you got a nice partner but peace I'm at peace with myself peace kills jealousy confidence kills doubt you know what confidence comes from knowledge brings confidence when you can do something and do it well and you know you can do it well there's a confidence why would I doubt the gift of God that he's placed in my life you got to learn how to see right you got to have eyes to be able to see this thing right you've been reading from left to right it's time to read from right to left read it right read it right read it right, read it right. Your real eyes are in your heart. Your real understanding is in your heart. You understand things in the heart. You may not realize it, but an embryo. When a mother's pregnant, she's discovered that she's pregnant. One of the first exams that they do is an ultrasound, a sonogram. And they're so excited because it's the first time that they see evidence of the sign of life that is growing on the inside of them. They go there and they witness the baby's heartbeat. The heart starts beating even before the brain is fully formed. You know what that tells us, the natural function of an embryo's heart beating? And you go there, I went and watched it on all five of my children. My wife was pregnant we saw evidence that there was life in the womb because of a heartbeat and I saw the heart beating even before the baby's brain was formed and it says to us spiritually that your heart can feel things and sense things that your head does not yet understand and I'm just telling you people are wasting their time when they argue with you trying to use reason for something in your gut your gut is really your heart it's the intelligence of your heart saying something's not right you ever just feel something in your heart there's something, something going on something something, something ain't right some, some something 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 and they can be rationalizing oh, 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 oh you just being you just you just you just you can't really talk them out of what they feel in their heart 
because there are times your real ear is in your heart, H-E-A-R-T. It's right in the center of your heart. So when God wants to speak to you, he's not talking to your head where things doubt. He's speaking to your heart so you can feel things in your heart. When God gives a vision, vision is not a function of the eyes. Sight is a function of the eyes. Vision is a function of the heart. So when God begins to put a vision on the inside of you of who you're going to be and what you're going to do and the impact that you're going to make in the world, it's not talking to your head because your head will say, how you going to do this? Nobody knows you. You don't have any money. You don't have any manpower. Your marketing team looks like trash. I mean, it'll start telling you, how in the world are you going to do something? But God will put something on the inside of you. You'll be crazy enough to just believe. I don't know how it's going to happen, but all that I know is that I'm getting ready to have my own business. I got to start with what I've got, use what I've got, and do all that I can, and trust Him. And as I begin to walk in the light that He gives me, He'll open up a way. He'll begin to show me. He's got people waiting to help me on the journey. You got to have it. The only way that I would know that is that I've got a vision in my heart. When I built this place, I had, we didn't have all of the members to be able to fill it up. But I believe that if you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. I built it before you got here because I saw something on the inside of my heart that nobody couldn't talk to me about. My head didn't conjure it up. It was a thing that I caught in my heart. Vision is a function of the heart. That's why you got to protect your heart. You can't share your dream with everybody who can't think on your level. They will judge your dream based on the realization of what has happened in their own world. And you'll be surprised that sometimes 80% of the people that you share your stuff with are glad if you don't make it and when bad things happen to you and only 20% will be there clapping for you and saying, I'm not intimidated by your light. I celebrate your light. Let it shine. 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 And so that's why he said, protect your valuables. Protect your valuables. And realize the valuables that are in your heart are connected to your mouth, what you say, and connected to your eyes, which is another portal of what you see. It can begin to create cravings in your heart by what you say and what you see. The third thing is our feet. Notice what it says, mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil, because that's what your feet want to do. You got to make a commitment to walk in the right uh, direction and then create a plan. A plan is where you map it out. Notice, mark out a straight path for your feet. Mark out a path for your feet. Which way am I going? It is, you need to have a, the GPS kind of direction telling you, I've mapped this plan out for my feet. Now listen, in the process of doing that, you have to determine where the danger zones are. Now here's the cliff. Some people love living on the edge. But if you live your whole life on the edge, it's just a matter of time before one day a strong wind is going to blow you over. One day you're going to be weak. One day you're going to be hungry. One day you're going to be thirsty. It's not a matter of if it'll happen. It's a matter of when. Sometimes your hormones will be acting up. You're fine on a regular day, but you know them hormonal cycles. You think differently when your hormones are engaged. You you feel differently when your hormones are engaged. And and it's not based on reason and logic and what you know is right or wrong. It is what it is. You got to know that and recognize that. That's why you you don't dance on the edge. You need to find out where the edge is and back up 10 feet. And realize now, when I cross over here, I'm in a danger zone. And so as long as I have measured out, I know where the danger is. Because I'm not going over there. You know, somebody called you at 1130 at night. (laughs) What you doing? You know what I'm doing. (laughs) You know where the edge is. And they're just trying to get you. Come come over here close. Come on, just slide over. Come on. Come on, just run through. You ain't got to stay. (laughs) 
Some of y'all know. <laughs> Notice these portals. Your mouth, what you say, your eyes, what you see, and your feet, where you go. Now, I want you to understand all three of them are connected because, you know, I've been, I've been standing out. I was standing out one day, and I was just observing a group of men, and uh, they, they were catcalling to women as every time a woman walked by. Ladies, I don't know how in the world y'all can deal with that when you see men stand up against the wall and you know you're being evaluated from head to, to toe. You, you, you know they're looking. Some of y'all know how to walk in and strut it and give them a show. I mean, a real. <laughs> but notice what they do first. They, they start catcalling. Mm-hmm. Hey, mama, what's your name? You know. If you were a biscuit, I'd sop you up. You know, and, and all kinds, you know. Their, their mouths get in action. Their eyes are engaged. And see, if their mouth and then their eyes start working well for them, they, they can tell. You, you can't tell by, by the woman when she looks at you the first time. Remember I said it's the second one that always takes a blessing. It's when she looks back. It's when he looks back. That's when you know you got their attention. Then that's when your feet get to stepping. <laughs> See, the mouth started something. The eyes confirmed it. And now the feet are going to try to consummate it. And it's all working together. Hey, 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 baby. Psst. Psst. <laughs> Satan in the garden in the form of the snake. Psst. Use his mouth. Then he used her eye. Take a look at this. It's good for food. Look at, just, just look at that. Had she not been over there looking at it, then her feet took her close. And again, it came from his voice, showed her something that she saw with her eyes, and the next thing you know, her feet are standing there at the tree, pulling forbidden fruit. They're all connected. The mouth the eyes and the feet because your feet have a tendency to take you to what where your eyes have seen and what your mouth has given assent to or consent and said i want that i want that i want that and the next thing you know the rest is history and here now comes a man with a baby carriage First, it used to be, that it sounds old-fashioned now to say first comes love and then comes marriage and then comes the, the man with the baby carriage, the lady with the baby carriage. But I want you to see that all of these are portals into your heart. He's saying guard your heart, guard your heart, guard your heart. But notice what Jesus said about the heart in Matthew chapter 15, verse 17 to 20. Anything that you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. Notice here the words again, the mouth. That's what defiles you. From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. But he's saying it's the stuff that comes out of your mouth that winds up in your heart. The stuff that's in your heart, it comes out of the heart. The stuff that comes out of a heart that has been contaminated is the stuff that begins to defile your life. That's why he says, guard your heart, protect your heart, protect your heart. As a part of the Sermon on the Mountain, uh, Jesus, he told us, he said, love those who want to hurt us. Say good things. To those who say bad things against you and then pray for people who give you pain that's not for babes in Christ that's for grown folks I mean Jesus told us that love your enemies pray for those that despitefully use you persecute you pray for them do good things to them listen because even when they do negative things and say negative things against you when you realize I am the seed of Abraham I'm a seed of God now let me tell you this 
Here's a secret. Even dirty water will make a seed grow. And somebody will be talking dirty to you. Dirty talk is when they say you can't do this and you ain't going to be anything. That's dirty talk. But even dirty water, when God has put a seed in you, doesn't have the power from stopping you from growing and succeeding and being everything that God has destined you to be. You're going to be what God destined you because that identity is in the seed of who God made you to be. And what's ever then the seed, whether the water is dirty or not, you're, he, he will use even dirty water to help you to grow. That's why some of you are going to have to one day go back to your enemies and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dirty water that will push you into a place. I got ready to run for the president of the student body of my high school with 2,000 students. I ran the idea against my, uh, uh, you know, around my mother, and she's one of my biggest cheerleaders. And, uh, and she said, boy, you, you, you can't be the president of, of the student body. I said, yes, I can. Yes, I can. And I said, you watch me. And I went into my prayer chamber, and I didn't compromise. And sure enough, when they voted, guess who they... Sometimes God will send somebody to stir you. It's a dare. I dare. When they say you can't do that, take it as a dare. That's the way I heard it. I heard it as a I dare you. I dare you to do it. There are certain things that will never bristle on the inside of you until somebody dares you. Until somebody tells you that you can't do this, this is not for you, that you're inadequate here, that somehow you don't have the right kind of background to be able to do this. You don't have the right credentials. Well, stand back and watch God. It's amazing. There are things that people do or fail to do that create opportunities to contaminate contaminate our heart with offense. See, Jesus said offenses must come. They're going to come with resentment, with bitterness, with unforgiveness, and with hate. You see, what people do or what they fail to do will bring offense, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, or hate because of what another two-legged human being did. You become offended. You'll have resentment, you'll have bitterness, you'll have unforgiveness, and sometimes you'll end up downright hating a person. But let me just tell you this, a lot of people think that love was just a New Testament uh, concept that Jesus brought, but it's an Old Testament concept. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 and 18, notice this, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. And this is dealing with your your sister. This is is not a, a gender thing. You shall not hate your brother or your sister in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him or her. You incur sin when you have hate, when you hate your brother. Whoever hates your brother, you're a murderer. He says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is God said, God told this, this is not Jesus, this is Leviticus. This is God speaking to Moses, listen, through him to the people saying, you shall not take vengeance. God says, vengeance belongs to me. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself, even when they've tried to do things that are offensive to you, things that made you resent them, things that made you bitter, things that made you carry unforgiveness. Forgive them. Let it go. I'm the one that's going to repay them. If you're going to hate them, how are you going to do that? And the the Hebrew words for hate your brother, actually, it, it simply means this. Do not diminish their status as human beings. Do not diminish their status as human beings. When he says, do not hate your brother, do not diminish their status as human beings. And listen, when blacks were in slavery in America, the reason that so much abuse happened with slaves is because black slaves were reduced as subhuman. It's hard to abuse people and recognize their humanity at the same time. But that was the reason that they could abuse people of another race and go to bed and sleep at night with no problem. And have you ever noticed that if you get angry with somebody, you begin to reduce them 
in the pictures that you say concerning them? I tell you, I grew up looking at uh, Sanford and Son, and I used to love it when Red Fox uh, and, uh, and Aunt Esther would get into a, a matter, you know, and she was a sanctimonious woman, and, and she would say, oh, Fred, you old fish-eyed fool. She called him a fish, but a fish is not a human. And, and have you ever noticed that when you want to abuse a person, that you strip away their humanity? And when the Bible says in the Hebrew, do not hate your brother, do not diminish their humanity. How dare a man refer to the woman as the B word? A B word is a female dog. That reduces your humanity. Now it's become a tender word of, you know, that's, that's my girl. That's my bee. We've gotten comfortable with dehumanizing imagery that has normalized behavior that is inhumane. And he's simply saying to us, don't hate your brother, because every time that you do that, you are reducing their humanity. Don't diminish them as human beings. You paint them as a dog, as a witch, as a worm, as a snake. You paint them as, as, as some type of a viper, as something that's dangerous. And so it's easy to abuse something that you do not acknowledge its humanity. But when I recognize the imago Dei, the image of God in every human being, no matter what race they are, no matter where they are located on the plan, planet, where their nationality, I recognize the Imago Dei, the image of God on the inside of them, even if they don't believe like I do. Every Buddhist, every Muslim, every Hare Krishna, whatever they are, there, there's an Imago Dei. They're still, they didn't create themselves, they were created in the image of God. And I recognize their humanity. They're not barbarian savages. They're human beings created by a wonderful creator God. But on another note, we have to also be aware of fake friends. 1 Corinthians 15, says, don't be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. That's why when parents are protecting their children, they need to bring this up. But listen, bad company, it's not that I don't trust you, I don't trust who you're with. I don't trust who's, who's, who's in your ear. Because until children reach about middle school, the parent in the nuclear family is the biggest influencer. But when they reach about middle school and high school, the parents are no longer the primary influencers on the development and the character of the child, but their friends are. Because you become like who you spend time with. So they want to be like their friends. For social acceptance, they want to be like their friends, but you certainly don't want to be with friends of bad character because it'll influence the character that you have and you'll start displaying a, a, a behavior on them. But this is why I would tell you, don't waste your time with, with, with fake people. You know why? Because you can think that, well, you know, they need someone to share the gospel and to be nice to them and to speak to them and everything. But you know, why would you waste your water on a fake flower? Water doesn't make fake flowers grow. Here's my idea is that you can only blossom relationships when they are genuine. You can only blossom a relationship when that relationship is genuine, when people genuinely want help, when they genuinely love you, when they genuinely respect you and honor you. You, you know, when there's a genuineness in the relationship, when they'll be honest with you and with themselves, you cannot help disingenuous people. And so they are not ready to be helped until they're ready to be real. People are not ready to be helped until they're ready to be real. That's how you know that people are ready to be helped. But now protecting your treasure will require the use of wisdom and discretion and discipline. Notice Proverbs chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. Discretion will protect you and understanding will guard you. Notice this, discretion, discretion. And wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse. Now, this is women too, this is not gender specific. We have left the straight path, who have left the straight path to walk in dark ways. 
who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil. They rejoice in it. Whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. So I want you to notice that. It says, even though all of that's in the world, discretion and understanding will preserve you. If you've got discretion and understanding. So as long as I understand that you are a snake, I know how to keep my distance. And so, though you have a boa constrictor and you're letting it wrap itself up close to you, he's really sizing you up. Because you can feed them, and they have a nature, they have an instinct. And they're going to do what they do because that's what they do. And it's their nature. It is their nature. But discretion will protect you because when you're around something that's dangerous, you have to know that it is dangerous. The deception comes in is when you lose your discretion and don't realize that my coming too close here can jeopardize my life. You have to know how to handle a snake. As long as you know it's a snake, it's okay. I know how to deal with you if you're a snake. I just know that. But you don't bring a snake that close and, and tempt them with things that their nature would cause them to attack. See, that's a part of wisdom and discretion that will preserve you. But wisdom is also more precious to you than any kind of material thing. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 15 says that wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Nothing, gold, diamond, platinum, it doesn't matter. Wisdom is more precious. It is more precious than any material kind of thing. And I want you to see how discipline is such a big part of our life. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32, better to be patient than powerful. It's better to be patient than powerful. You know why? Because patience shows incredible control. It says better to have self-control than to conquer a city. When you can control your own spirit, your own attitude, your own temper, your own passions, when you can control that, that's a, that's a strong person. You see, discipline is the strongest form of self-love. Discipline. It is the strongest form of self-love. And that's why when you're doing something, um, when you're tempted to quit, it's your discipline that keeps you going. And there have been some times that I've gone in and worked out, and then I'm sore, and then I say to myself, I'm not going tomorrow because I'm sore. But here's the, here's the truth. Sore today, strong tomorrow. Sore today, stronger tomorrow. Sore today, stronger tomorrow, little by little. And if you're really going to be able to preserve yourself, you're going to have to be able to get your priorities in a certain order. Take a look at this little picture. This, this will help you. You see the long list there? That's what you could do. Some people are so gifted and creative, they could do a lot of things. But then there are certain things that you should do. And then there's a much shorter list that you must do. When you're getting your priorities straight, you have to realize not everything is a priority, but your priorities reveal your values. So start with what you must do, then with what you should do, and then what you could do, but get your priorities. You must do this. You should do this. You could do that. You use that to help, help you get your priorities. You control your time because time is value. And listen, let me just remind you of this. You can be a kind person and you can still say no to people. You can be a kind person and still set boundaries. You can be a kind person and still disagree with people. You can be a kind person and still be honest. You can still stand up for yourself. You can still challenge poor behavior. You can still protect your time and space. You can still leave toxic environments when respect is no longer being served. You can still take time for self-care and mental health. And still be a kind person. That doesn't make you unkind. It makes you wise. And so now to protect your treasure is what I would say, give God your heart. Give God your heart. Colossians 3.3 3 says that we are hid with Christ in God. Give God your heart. Give God your heart. Secondly, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Be discriminating about what you allow to enter you. Through your mouth, what you speak, your ears, what you listen to, your eyes, what you see, your feet, where you go. And then number three, 
Let God guide your heart. Let God guide your heart. You know Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. Let God guard your heart. Let him guide your heart. And then number four, let God's word govern your heart. Let God's word govern your heart. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you richly richly let that word dwell richly in you and it will govern your heart and it's amazing that whatever god has given you as a treasure you have to use it or you lose it you know that unused money devalues anybody that's still keeping all of your money up under the mattress <laughs> here in an old shoebox somewhere uh, it, it is it is it's not been there because it's not been gaining any interest that's why money is called currency it's designed to move and if it's not in circulation like electricity it's currency it's got to be running it has no ability to be able to appreciate it will devalue and so the same little thirty dollars that great grandpa saved up back in the 30s has devalued now you can't even go to the grocery store. You can buy, they get two hamburgers and fries with that. <laughs> because it is devalued. Unused money devalues. Unused talent diminishes. Unused machinery disintegrates. Unused time evaporates. You can't save time. Unused potential erodes. Unused knowledge dissipates. And unused ideas, they never die. They simply pop into somebody else's head. And if you sit on a God idea that God popped into your head, and if you don't do it, you sit there, you'll watch God over a period of time pop that idea into another head that will be obedient to it, and then somebody will do what God had given you the idea, and you will see and start claiming somebody stole your idea. No, no, no. Because you didn't catch it, it ricocheted off of you and went to somebody else who was open. It's like a ball, and I want you to see that if you don't catch that idea, it will ricochet off of you and somebody else is going to catch it and make what was a good idea for you. They're going to make that thing a reality and you're going to feel like somebody stole your dream. But the great tragedy of life isn't death, but the resources that die within you while you're still alive. It's not death. It's the resources that die in you while you're still alive. And sometimes protecting your treasure means seeking the help of others. Don't try to do it all by yourself. It takes a village. It takes a village. God matures us in community, not in isolation. He matures us in community. We need the village again. We've gotten weak because of the no village. When there was a village, everybody didn't need a therapist. The village was your therapist. Big Mama was your therapist. Now, there are some extreme issues. There are some stuff I, I understand. They're above my pay grade. And I have to refer people to professional help. But there's a blessing that comes by being in the village that will help us to even make wise decisions for our life. I want to give you a few guidelines. How do we make wise decisions? How do we make wise decisions? Get advice from trustworthy people. Trustworthy, that's an underline that word. Trustworthy people. Then learn from the mistakes of others. I, I refuse to have people teach me who've never made mistakes. I mean, what did they have to say to me? Because if I'm making a mistake trying to learn, how do you even identify with me? Uh, so I, I, mistakes are our greatest teacher. You learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. Learn from the mistakes of others. Then consult relevant biblical texts. You know, stop looking for a word and start looking for a verse. Get a verse, get a word from God. See what the, the Bible has to say about it. Get the biblical text. Then examine your cautious. See what God is speaking in your heart. When, when peace is in your, in your cautious, peace. Peace is the greatest umpire of your soul. It's the great umpire of your soul. And when, where peace prevails, there is the will of God. Examine your cautious. Then examine your motives. So I know I'm deciding on doing this. Am I doing this so that I can chase more money and I might end up losing my peace of mind while I'm going for a piece of luxury? 
to try to get a bigger house? Should I do this and jeopardize the peace of our family? Examine your motives. Why are you doing what you're doing? And then think about the best use of your gifts and abilities. If I do this, is this the best use of my gifts and my abilities? If I take my time to do this now, is this the best use of my gifts and my abilities? And then assess your decision's impact on others. If I make this decision, how is this going to affect other people that my life is connected to? How will this connect my spouse, my, my son, my daughter? How will this connect people that are on my team, that are, that are in, uh, you know, in my classroom? You know, if I make this, how will this impact others? And then pray, 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 pray. Don't wait to do prayer last. I mean, see, this is not in the order of, of priority and importance, but include prayer. Get advice from trustworthy people. Learn from the mistakes of others. Consult relevant biblical texts. Examine your conscience. Examine your motives. Think about the best use of your gifts and, t- and abilities. Uh, assess your decisions, impact on others, and pray. And there are some people who are here today that need to make some decisions. And I just wanted to give you a little template of some things that you can go through that this is not just about me. How is this going to impact, impact people who love me? I don't want to do something and then it destroys my relationships. I don't want to do something and then I lose my peace of mind. God, I want to be where you want me to be. I don't want to go chasing dollars if I go to this other state, this other city, if it takes me out of the will of God, if my mission and assignment is here. I want to be where God needs me to be. And even if it looks like a danger zone, the safest place that you can be is in the will of God. And I want you to realize that when this Bible talks about guard your heart, protect your valuables, your treasure, with all diligence, there's a reason that he gave us a breastplate of righteousness, because that heart is encapsulated in the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to be right. If you want something to last, you've got to be right. If the foundation is not right, it will wind up crumbling. And it's got to be saved. And so the heart is located between both the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. You got to be saved right to even see right. And you got to have the right heart to be able to have the breastplate of righteousness. This is not of my opinion and living my own truth. This is about being and doing what is right, not based on my feelings, not based on my opinion, but it is based on the Word of God. And may I remind you of this truth. This is wisdom of the ages that is better than knowledge of the moment. The Ancient of Days has given us more wisdom in this book. This is my treasure book. If I were to lose everything else, as long as I've got the truth and the principles of this, as long as I've got this treasure, I can get more other treasure. But if I lose this, I lose my soul. We're saved by grace through faith in this word, in a living God who's so real to us. He means the world to us. And if you ever get the truth of the living God, this is a treasure book. Not only is it a treasure book, but it's a map to help you to order your steps to get to where the real treasures are. And we want to ask God, order my steps in your word, according to your word. Because Jesus, I want to be right. I want to do what's right. And I want to just invite you right now, in this moment, to just bow your head and just ask God to examine you. Because some of you are at critical junctures and positions of decisions that need to be made in your life. And you're saying, God, I I just need you to lead me and to guide me. Should I get into this relationship? If you're in a bad relationship, the question is now, Lord, should I stay here? What do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do, Lord? I've talked and said everything that I know to my daughter. And her life is still off kelter. I've said everything that I know to say to my son. And it still looked like going down the wrong path. There's a decision that needs to be made. And I want to encourage you today, 
to ask God to turn the searchlight of his word on you. You can't control another human being, but you, you can only control who you are and what you do and what God has given you to do. When you obey God, that will create the domino effect of everything else that needs to fall. When you submit and fall on the rock, it's better than having the rock to fall on you. And today is our place of falling on that rock and saying, God, I trust you with my very life today. I trust you with my family today, Lord. Things are crazy in this world now. They're sick individuals. People get sick in isolation. Every time that we have a sick human being who has an idea to assassinate someone and to snuff out somebody else's life, they've been living on the fringes of life and they didn't have their village. They made poor decisions and not realizing that if I do this, I'm going to hurt somebody that loves them because every person is connected to somebody who cares about them, whether you realize it or not. And it is our way of saying, God, search me and know my thoughts. Try me and know my ways, God. And if there be any wicked way in me, Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in your will. Lead me according to your word, God. Lord, I want to be your servant. I give myself to you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Lord, use whatever you can for your glory. Whatever you can for your glory, Lord. God's not looking for perfect people who've never made a mistake, who've never dealt with messy situations. God says, I will take messy people, broken people, the rejects of society, dope addicts, sex addicts, he says, I'll take you and I can build into you a mighty army. He said, if you'll trust me and if you'll let my word, put my word in your mouth and speak it out, you'll begin to change the whole tenor and contents of your heart. God wants to change your life and then use you as an agent of change. God changes the person and then uses the person to change the place. You know that he is the God who has delivered and he's still in the delivering business. He still delivers and he yet shall deliver. And God's not looking for perfect people to serve him. He's looking for broken people that'll trust him. He's looking for hurt people, abused people, folks that have been alcoholics and drug addicts that will say, Lord, the good, the bad, and the ugly, whatever it is that I have in my life, God, I give it to you. And if you can use anything, Jesus, use it for your glory. He's not looking for a person who's never made a mistake. He's looking for people that have failed time and time again. But if they'll say, Lord, if there's anything that you can use in me. Some that have habitually made bad choices. Some that have stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped and started. He kept a so-called paradise in the toss. It's a season now. Bashke paradosa. Deve sikoramba keti aposa korumadis. A new season shall come and my spirit will bristle on the inside of you and give you now a new grace to finish what you start. And there will be a strength and a resolve of will to see it through, see it through, see it through. No longer will the struggle that is there cause you to back away, but the strength will be there. For you to finish what you start this time finish it says the lord hallelujah to the lamb hallelujah to the lamb of god hallelujah to the lamb of god lay your hand on yourself say i'm gonna finish well come on prophesy with your mouth stand to your feet right now stand up stand up stand up stand up with faith in your heart come on let's declare that said, i'm going to finish i'm a finisher because the author and the finisher of my faith lives in me. I'm going to see it through. I'm a winner. I'm a fighter. I will not quit until I finish my God assignment. I will not die before my time. I rebuke in premature death may strength come to me right now may clarity of mind may resolve of will rise up in me 
right now. I will finish well. I will finish strong. Use me, Lord. Whatever I have, it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. And you are mine. In Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.